Lack of power is our dilemma. There we go. Good evening. My name is Herb, and I already said that. Welcome to our 12-step tradition workshop. Oh, shallow group tonight. Please join me in the prayer for an open mind. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 traditions in you, for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my brokenness, the 12 traditions, and especially you. This is the foreword to the pamphlet, AA Tradition, How It Developed, written by Bill Wilson in 1955. How shall we AAs best preserve our unity? When an alcoholic applies the 12 steps of our recovery program to his personal life, his disintegration stops and his unification begins. The power which now holds him together in one piece overcomes those forces which had rent him apart. Exactly the same principle applies to each AA group and to Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. So long as the ties which bind us together prove far stronger than those forces which would divide us if they could, all will be well. We shall be secure as a movement. Our essential unity will remain a certainty. May we never forget that without permanent unity, we can offer little lasting relief to those scores of thousands yet to join us in their quest for freedom. It is the purpose of this workshop to review and discuss each of the 12 traditions so we may better understand and apply them to our fellowship and to our personal lives. Please join me in a few minutes of meditation on that purpose. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We are here to talk about our second legacy, unity, and to review the 12 traditions. Crosstalk is allowed in a loving and supportive manner to be informed and helpful are our only goals. There were a couple handouts today, which we'll talk about later on. And that's it. All right. I like to uh, kind of warm us up with uh, a review of some material from uh, comparing the steps and the traditions. to give us uh, some sense of that. And I uh, handed out a couple things which will uh, also give you the sense of principles and some other items for each of the traditions. Tonight I handed out, although those of you who have been exposed to my work in the past already have it, probably a list of the principles that are relevant to each of the steps so that now you, I think, have a full package of principles for the steps and principles for the traditions. Each individual is a spiritual entity with a spiritual malady, a cancer of the soul that leads to disintegration. The steps are a path to God for personal integration. Similarly, each group is a spiritual entity subject to group spiritual malady, self-will run riot for the group, or disunification. The traditions are the group's path to the will of God, in the same way that the steps are the individual's path to the will of God, and a sense of unity and harmony. Unity for the steps within the individual, unity with the traditions within the group and amongst the groups. The steps are acts contrary to the individual self-will. The traditions are acts contrary to the group's self-will, especially in the group conscience. Okay. So uh, I'm sort of getting the hang of how to do the workshop on a public large level. And I will start with looking at the questions that one page, which is a worksheet, that shows the short and the long form of the traditions. The short form of tradition three is the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop 
You know, the big book has a line in, I think, one of the prefaces that says the only requirement for AA membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. But when they were formulating the traditions, they dropped the word honest because Bill said no newcomer could be honest about anything. <laughs> the long form, our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. See, we don't have any rules in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't know about the other fellowships, but I'm assuming if you have traditions that they pretty much follow the same kind of spirit. There are no rules. You don't have to be sanctioned by central office in your area or by a uh, general service office in New York. If you gather two or three people together for sobriety, you can call yourself an AA group, provided that you don't have any other affiliation. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And of course, that <coughs> worksheet has three questions which will keep you engaged with the discussion that we will have. And that is, what did I hear? What does it mean? And what are the implications for my life? We do have a uh, complete supply now, I believe, uh, plenty for everybody, of the language of the heart. So after the meeting, if you don't have it, you're certainly welcome now to get it, unless you found a resource to be able to download it, and that uh, might be good. Although it's always, quite frankly, good to have the source documents from my standpoint. You may want to have this anyway and read it uh, the balance of it on your own. It's, um, it's wonderful information from Bill Wilson um, segmented in the various periods of the development of AA. And we're going to be looking at Tradition 3, page 79. And so uh, I'm assuming that you have it, that you've read it, that you've highlighted it. So we're not going to read it here, but we are going to look at the highlights on page 79, and we do have a microphone, I'm assuming it's on, uh, so you're welcome to do that. I don't make any requirements, we don't have any rules here either, um, but I do suggest that uh, you use the microphone so that everybody can clearly hear whatever your comments are about the highlights on page 79. Anybody have highlight on 79 that they would like to talk about? Please, Michael. And he's going to model it right out of the chute here. There we go. In short, Alcoholics Anonymous has no membership rule. I'm skipping ahead. We do not wish to erect the slightest barrier between ourselves and the, f and the fellow alcoholic who still suffers. Yeah, that's really the point. No barriers at all. No rules. All right? That's the, the spirit of this uh, tradition here. Anybody else have any highlights on that page, please? You want to announce your name? It's fine. And if you don't, by the way, we are recording this. So if you don't want to be recorded, don't talk. And if you do uh, want to be recorded, but you don't want your name, don't give your name. It's pretty straightforward. All right. Hi, thank my, you. My name is Katie. I am an alcoholic. Hi, Katie. Hi, thank you. Uh, I like the word, if he is anything, the sick alcoholic is a rebellious nonconformist. Yeah. Uh, which reminds me of the rebellion dogs are every step in the big book, which I think is a great name for a rock band, rebellion dogs. <laughs> but it also, in the long run, made me recognize that if I don't ask, you know, everything is open to receive, but it was so hard for me to ask. So removing no barriers faced me with the idea that I had to be open to receive. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Thank you. Any other highlights on that page? I, I love the one. We must enter the dark cave where the alcoholic is. All right. Not only does it tell us about the condition of the alcoholic in the darkness of the cave, and, uh, uh, but it also indicates uh, uh, the spirit of uh, outreach. It literally is, we go where they are. 
We enter their dark cave. We bring the light of our experience into that darkness. I, I think it's uh, all there in that l poetic piece. Rob? Yeah, I'm, I'm Rob. I'm a compulsive overeater. Hi. Um, you know, there were some things. Uh, there were some things that came up with these readings that were confusing to me, um, and I'll point out one because I'm not sure of the implication. But in the, uh, I guess the last long paragraph, in the middle of the paragraph, it says, "One can think of no AA member who would like to see the formation of dry groups or wet groups or communist groups, etc." And this this leads me to think, well, how does the how does the current um, the current fellowship, where there are many, many, many special interest yeah. themed groups, yeah. how does that balance against the original concept of the traditions? Yeah. I really wonder what people think about that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a real wonderful challenge, actually. We have men's groups and women's groups. At the very least, we have doctor's groups, we have lawyer's groups, we have pilot's groups, we have gay groups, all right? And uh, that's Rob's point, exactly, here. All right. Anybody want to address that? I mean, in terms of their experience with it or any other highlights on that page? Please. I'm still an alcoholic. Uh, well, the only, I think I read this someplace, but of course I'm making it up, <laughs> that. Um, since they're, if it's a gay group or a doctor's group or any of those things, they're not officially affiliated with another organization, but they invite members. I, I think I remember someplace that it's in a sense of inviting and attraction and openness rather than yeah. you can only come if you are gay or you only yeah. come if you're a doctor, which I don't believe I've ever seen. Have you ever tried to walk into a men's stag meeting? I actually uh, was at the beach once. I saw the 12 and 12, and I was desperate for a meeting, and I sat next to it. And afterwards, these guys said, well, it was a men's meeting, but we let you stay. And I was See, so now happy. that's a healthy meeting. That's a healthy meeting when the spirit of the traditions was very much embraced there. Please. I heard. I'm Richard, alcoholic. Uh, it says, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there are no musts. And then there's like over a hundred in the big book. It's kind of yeah. funny. Uh, here's a couple. I must turn all things to the Father who presides over us all. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah. I must have this thing. And there's, there's a ton of them. There's over a hundred. But there are no musts in the sense of rules and regulations, but there's strong encouragement implied in the context of those musts. Yes. Yeah, like uh, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. You don't yes, know, you, it is strongly recommended you put your parachute on before jumping. Right. Please. I'm less alcoholic. Hey, Les. Um, my experience with the special interest groups or meetings, um, I think it's addressed at the bottom of the uh, pamphlet that you gave us where they talk about it. My experience was I first went to a 12-step meeting, but immediately went to what's known as the other bar, the lawyers group. And at the time, as you say, uh, most alcoholics don't know how to be, or Bill said, don't know how to be honest. I, I didn't know that uh, drugs and alcohol was going to be my only problem. I was really more concerned about trying to get into what would be my chosen profession. And so that was a link where sobriety was a foundation, but we had a, uh, in that particular instance, it was happened to be, you know, people trying to pass the bar, people that were disbarred, people that were judges or whatever and doing it. So the purpose was to, it was just a commonality of people trying to follow the 12 steps and never in that or any even men's meetings or any other special interest meetings I've gone to, have they ever said it was a substitute for, uh, you know, general AA meetings? Right, right. So I couldn't relate to just being with a bunch of drunks or a bunch of cokeheads <laughs> only or whatever, you know, my issues were, which were multitude at the time. I needed, you know, I was looking as a solution, hopefully, yeah. to stop doing it to be able to relate to that profession. Yeah. And it was a good stepping stone until I was more willing to, you know, delve into the yeah. different steps. I, I think personally my experience is that uh, men 
are really well served by going to at least one men's stag meeting a week as part of their, if they're going to multiple meetings, the same with women going to women's stag meetings because there's, there's a camaraderie and there's an identification and there's a safety. The, all of the stuff that just intuitively you know uh, that is the benefit of it. But I, I, don't, I recommend that people don't make it an exclusive diet of stag meetings or for doctors, for instance. It's incredibly important for them to be in a room where they can really identify at the deepest level and have some confidence about confidentiality just by the nature of their professions. But again, and I sponsor a couple doctors, I suggest that they have a variety of meetings, whether they share or not in those other meetings is up to them, but that they need to be part of the whole rather than an exclusive group. So I think that's kind of the spirit of it. Uh, my home group uh, had a woman uh, come uh, to it and um, she walked in like a deer in headlights when she walks in. And we didn't know it, but it, she'd never been to a meeting. And this is like 15 guys, and we just scanned the room. And I could just read the group conscience. And, and I said, you're welcome to sit down. All right, everybody was really very much okay with that. And she sat down. She didn't say anything. And then she left right afterwards. But there, there was that inclusivity that if you come, you're welcome but it's not the sort of the um, open invitation kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, another group that I go to, a men's stag meeting, and uh, they have a committee of three people who are on alert for somebody, not necessarily a woman, but let's say somebody walks in and they're a drug addict. And they refuse to say, I'm an alcoholic or I'm having a drinking problem or I have a, a desire to not drink. Those are the three formulas, right? That'll keep you in an AA meeting that's closed. And uh, they, they then would politely get up and escort them out, but sit with them in the parking lot until the meeting is over, having a meeting outside the meeting. You see, we're prepared to do that. Uh, last night we had this discussion and one woman uh, had been in a different area and uh, she got literally shouted out of the room by the men, uh, which was obviously not the spirit of AA or the traditions. Um, so uh, it came to the, our discussion last night that maybe you want to bring to your group conscience well, what do we do if there's somebody here that doesn't actually belong here or there's somebody here who is disruptive? It's been known that actually a drinking alcoholic may want into an AA meeting. And, you know, it's a shock of all shocks these days. And uh, a lot of meetings are really uncomfortable with that. And if they become restless and uh, irritable and discontent, they're even more uncomfortable with how to deal with it. So you it would be behoove us to be prepared to be able to deal with that in some way of welcome and hospitality. Hi, my name's Greg, and I'm a lot of things. <laughs> but um, I, I, one of the instances, well, in, in, a, in, a, in um, gay, uh, gays in, in Los Angeles used to uh, have their own completely separate service structure. I'm not gay, but um, and they would they would at their meetings they would have to identify as uh, my name is such and such I'm a gay alcoholic and they had to say gay alcoholic and and it took a lot for them to get incorporated into the service structure. Uh, I'm taking I'm speaking sp specifically to the central office of Los Angeles of, of Alcoholics Anonymous and they, you know they got incorporated into into there and now there's a little G that signifies that it's a gay meeting you know. And uh, um, and there were, when I was at Central Office, there was also discussion about the there there are these yoga meetings, these twelve step yoga meetings, and there was a dis there was a debate about whether or not they should are they are they AA are they not AA is it considered meditation, was, you know and 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 uh, uh, I was I was one of the ones in, for incorporating them into the directory and and I, and I lost I was in the minority, but. Uh, um, 
So it's 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 whatever. It's just well, it, I guess it would depend on, and I don't want to have that debate, but I, it would depend on their primary purpose, what their intention is, and what their affiliation. Is. If their intention is uh, we're a meditation group that we're alcoholics, that may not be an Alcoholics Anonymous group. That may be a group of meditators who just happen to be alcoholic. Same with the, like yoga. So, I mean, there would be all kind of variations on a theme here. But you can see this is not an uncomplicated issue, especially in a city like Los Angeles, which is very complicated. Justin Alcoholic. Hi, Justin. Um, to get back to the uh, closed meeting. Yes. I've been to meetings before, and um, they, they ask, they go around the room, and everybody says their name. They say they're an alcoholic. Yeah. And sometimes there's people in the room who, who don't even know they're alcoholic. That is correct. And they're visiting, or some a friend brings them. Yes. And uh, on a few occasions, I've seen the people very mean to that person if they don't raise their hand and call themselves an alcoholic. Yeah. And they're asked to leave. But yeah. I've never seen any. I've never seen it done nicely. <laughs> oh well, see, that's an untrained meeting. Because if it's a closed meeting, people who aren't alcoholic don't belong there. And a comment. They don't belong there. If you're a visitor or a student or a doctor doing your term paper. If it's a closed meeting, you don't belong there. Go to an open meeting. All right? Now, even in open meetings... Uh, anybody can come to an open meeting, but most of the cultures of the open meeting are that only alcoholics can share. But I'm aware of several meetings where the meeting culture has said anybody who's there in an open meeting can share. All right? That's the group conscience, and I totally respect that. I don't agree with it, but I totally respect their uh, group conscience to have it that way. Right. I, just, I was the last one to know that I was an alcoholic. Well, so, likewise, I, I walked into the meeting saying, uh, I, I'm uh, exploring being an alcoholic. But at, le yeah, but at least that raises the question. Now, there are people who are there, mm, and they don't know uh, the, the, the vocabulary and the, the not-so-subtleties of it. Hmm? Or the rules. Well, there's no rules. There's just traditions. Now, the group itself may feel, feel that they have rules. <laughs> Of course. We're human beings, right? And we'll make a religion out of anything. <laughs> Nicole Alanon. Nicole. My very first AA meeting as an Alanon, nobody raised their hand to share. And so what's common what I've found to be more common in AA from the leader versus Alanon is finger pointing and picking people to share. Oh uh-huh. Well, I was the first person they pointed to. <laughs> I didn't know what to do at that point, and I shared, and I was like, well, I'm, I'm Al-Anon, and I don't really know what I'm, and they let me do it. But yeah. I think, and now that, that was a very warm and kind welcome. And so I, I don't know if it was an open meeting or a closed yeah. meeting, but I feel like, you know, there's a lot of room for mistakes and for, that kind of thing to happen. Maybe I was just lucky, but... Well, th I think the bottom line of this discussion is be prepared in your meeting to handle these kind of variations with a helpful attitude, not a hostile attitude. That hostility comes from fear and the frustration and the lack and the embarrassment of not knowing what to do. So you may as well be angry and scare the out of them, right? Exactly. All right. Let's go to page 80. Are there any highlights on page 80 that you would like to talk about? All right. They have no other affiliation. All right. Meaning that you don't name the group after uh, UX Borax Company, you know, be, <laughs> or, you know, so, yeah, I'd be silly about that. But it's really an important point, and it's not a subtle point, all right, that we are self-enclosed. Please, George. Hi, George Brown, alcoholic. Um, there are some groups which, or some meetings which are AA slash Al-Anon meetings, 
uh, where they have both, and those are not allowed to be called AA meetings. Well, that's because they're not AA directory. meetings. Yeah, but I mean, they're, they're fellowship meetings. They're just they're uh, still like this. AA this is not an AA meeting, right. and yet you come to my step workshop. It's some of the best AA you'll ever... <laughs> well, I'm modest about it. All right, hopelessly compromised and divided if we have these other affiliations. We need the straight AA activities. We think that AA should offer its experience to the whole world for whatever use can be made of it, but not its name. That's the purpose here. That's the point. We should always be inclusive, never exclusive. Offering all we have to all. Save our title. And, you know, Bill is very consistent with that. When he wrote the big book in 1939, that first paragraph in the first printing of the preface says, our way of living may have its advantages for all. He had that wonderful intuition that this was a formula for human nature. It wasn't just a remedy for alcoholics that in fact it was a spiritual solution to a spiritual malady, which is the human malady. Selfishness and self-centeredness, self will run riot. Unity thus is preserved. Keep in mind that that's the, the flag under which the traditions are flying, and that is unity. Every tradition is is, is uh, written, uh, what do you call it, wordsmith, to protect the unity of the group and therefore the fellowship so that we ha maintain our integrity. Okay, so please, uh, go. Microphone. <laughs> Nicole Allen on. Hi, Nicole. So is that why Bill early on, uh, he helped, I don't know if he helped, so I don't really have the history down, but I've heard that he like went with N.A. and gave them his blessings. N.A.? N.A., yeah. Oh, I don't know. Not that he went there himself, but he like offered his blessings for N.A. to start. When does N.A. start? What year? Anybody know? When? No, not that early. No, it's, it's relatively recent, and it started here in L.A., so I know it. They wouldn't license them to steps, so they stole them and wrote their own big book. Yeah. So that AA wised up and licensed the step to anyone who wants it. Yeah. I, AA doesn't license anybody, by the way. No. Uh -uh. Okay. That ends. Yeah, so I, I really don't know the history of N.A., yeah. I'm sorry. I was actually more asking on from the AA perspective. I don't know the history of N.A., and the you asked about bills... That, in, uh, involvement with NA. I don't know. It's in 1953. All right. Um, so uh, Tradition 3 uh, on uh, the 12 and 12, page 139. Do we have any uh, highlights on that? On, on page um, 139, Tradition 3. Now, I'm assuming you all read these and highlight them. And maybe there's nothing of interest on that page for you, or maybe you're just shy, and that either is just fine. But Richard's neither of those. <laughs> but he is slow. <laughs> There's George. Go ahead, George. Hi, quick one. George Bell, alcoholic. Um, you know, it said... Uh, the second paragraph, first line, to establish this principle of membership took years of a harrowing experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, these um, traditions came from the letters that came to the central office that Bill and his crew were answering about the various things. Uh, one of the things we handed out was uh, a laughable document. It was the application to become a member of AA. You know, it's kind of like 1947. Look at the date. Just before the traditions were published. Please, George. Richard. Richard Alcoholic. At the end of the second paragraph. Which of us may be the next? 
Which of us may be the next? And, and he's got this wonderful poetic image. We are flickering candles in a windstorm. Listen to the fragility of that. We, in this room, flickering candles in a windstorm. Which of us is next? And it says at the top there, you're a member if you say, hello, this is up to the individual. You are a member if you say so. Think about the implications of that concerning your own sobriety date. Your sponsor doesn't tell you what your sobriety date is. You make your own determination. Now, you may want to have a conversation with your sponsor or other people if there's been some kind of a issue that's developed around it. But in the final analysis, it's about you and prayer and God and coming to grips with your own decision about that. Nobody else gets to say that to you. All right, let's flip the... Pi oh, please, Sarah. I'm Sarah, food addict. Hi, Sarah. And on, on the first page there, uh, we just want to be sure that you get the same great chance for sobriety that we've had. That's it. That's it. See, so yeah, we want to be helpful, and we want the people who are suffering like we suffered to have this organization available. That's why the traditions are here, to protect the group and the organization against the individual egos and the group egos. I mean, we could, for as much as we're bonded here, and most of us know each other, we've been in meetings before together, we've been in the step meeting before, maybe or other, and we've certainly been here, now this is our third meeting on the traditions. If we put ourselves in a circle and threw out a question that we wanted to resolve, can you imagine the chaos that we would have in terms of the various opinions and experiences that we would have? I mean, and we like one another, and we have spiritual principles. Yeah. What about those less uh, blessed or graced? Sir. Yeah, I was kind of shocked. I hadn't read this in many years, but uh, just the fear that they had. Like, which, yeah, yeah. which of us would be next? You know, yeah. we're going to be struck drunk. They didn't know how it worked. I, I, they really didn't. Did no. I, I, I had that the first six months. Yeah. And then, you know, from 1981 till now, no. I yeah. I not had that thought of, oh, yeah. my God, it's going to happen. Yeah. So that, that was... Uh, that was interesting to read. Well, there was a tremendous amount of fear because they really didn't know how it worked. In fact, that was the mm, chapter that Bill struggled with, trying to figure out how it did work. And in meditation, of course, asking himself that question, he came up with the list of the 12 steps. Hi, Clayton Alcoholic. Hi. I just wondered if you all could give us some, um, like some examples of how you apply the the, the third tradition to friends and family. Yeah. Because I've been, you know, struggling with that a little bit. Could, yeah. Could I kind of open that? Yeah. And, and one of the things I think is the richness of the traditions and one of the primary reasons that I'm doing the workshop for on the traditions is to apply the principles of the traditions to our personal relationships with our significant other, with our family, with our work, with our environment and community. Absolutely. Um, we do have some questions um, toward the end, and I'm going to try to get to those uh, more quickly than we have in the past. Um, but if anybody has anything they want to say in answer to that right now, I'd be happy to hear from you about applying the third tradition directly to your family or significant relationship. <laughs> he skates up. Jason, alcoholic. Hi, Jason. Um, my family and my uh, and most of my friends are pretty religious, and so the way i well, doing this work on on um, tradition three has been very enlightening. But it's helped me because, like, some of them, I'm like, how do you could you even say you know God, you know, or even attempt to? They're so arrogant, and manipulative. But I mean, aren't we all, you know? And I'm going. I'm going, okay, well, I guess if, if, if it's a grace thing, if God, if this is like a real grace thing and this is a real spiritual journey, they've got every right, and who am I? And, um, and then 
also what's helped me with this tradition is, um, is when he said there the 12 and 12 isn't fear the basis of all our intolerance. And I'm going, oh, this is, this is where they're getting all their legalism from. You know, all their little doctrines and rules and to-do lists and all this stuff. And I'm like, it's just fear. Seeing that, it's helping me have more compassion towards them and just being more tolerant myself of them. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. Love and tolerance is our code is the sort of the theme of the 10th step. Hi, Kim Alanon. Thank Hi. you. So um, I'm going to jump ahead, but I had an experience today that I wanted to share, which was the line, who dared to be judged, jury, and executioner of his own sick brother. So in relationship to um, my work, where my ego comes up a lot, um, I had a situation today where I looked at step three, and um, you know I, I'm, I'm a little more willing to turn things over to God, so that's my part, because I know I have choices. So I went into a meeting today where I had to bring up something that a coworker wasn't um, wasn't uh, executing, and so I thought about this tradition three because I thought, well, where are we all inclusive? We're all inclusive in the aspect for me that we're trying to get the same job done. My step is this, his step is this, and whatnot. But there's a bump in the road, and his step wasn't getting done. So you know. Um, trying not to judge my brother and um, trying to come from the unified, inclusive aspect of, of we are a whole as a part of this department. Um, so that said, what I practiced was being patient and tolerant with this person, accepting my powerlessness and knowing that I'm not helpless, so I can bring up what my concern is in a kind, patient, tolerant way, and also being willing to let go of the results, but knowing that if I say what I mean and mean what I say, and that if I, if I allow things to unfold for the greater good, for the, this is like, this is not my ego anymore, but I, if I sit back and don't say anything, I'm going to resent and be bitter. So I have to find a way to keep that, that balance of, of, I see myself in step three, I see, I see myself, I have to go to God. In the tradition, I have to recognize that I'm a part of this whole and I have a voice but I'm still powerless over it. So um, that's how I worked it today from a work standpoint um, to keep my life manageable. Does that yes, and, and just to clarify something or expand on it actually, because you use the word integrity, you see you're a cell in the body that's attempting to be a healthy cell for the benefit of the body. And it might be that you need to confront the other cell and hurt their feelings and be disliked mm. because it's in the best interest of the entire organ. Integrity then is supporting the unity. Your integrity is a benefit to the integrity of the whole and by your, it, you may or may not be correct and you may make a mistake, but at least your intention and your thought processes was, were correct. Yeah, I think that was it. I think you just said it. My intention was clearer because it, and my motivation was like, okay, if I sit back, I know I'm going to resent this and be bitter. But if I, if I can speak up and say it in a, in a kind way, yes, and that strength of like, yeah. oh, God, what are they going to think? Yeah. You know? yeah. but, but trying to position that. Right. The motivation, even, I'm, I really find that I'm taking the motivations in the traditions, too. Like, what's the motivation yeah. on a group level? That's, yeah. that's really big for me right yeah. now. Motivation. What moves us? Movere, the Latin, motivation. I'm, I'm Rob Codependent, and just very briefly, I just wanted to lift up the uh, third tradition in CODA is the only requirement for membership in CODA is a desire for healthy and loving relationships. And so in CODA, there's not uh, really a split between at least this tradition and 
um, trying to live out what we're doing in the life around us as well as in the rooms. So yeah. it's a great tradition. It's about unity. It's about the relationship and the health of the person and the health of the whole. Excellent. Thank you. Please. Hi, Bonnie, alcoholic. Bonnie. I'm actually glad that we're studying this. I actually learned a little bit about myself when I was reading this on page. I hope so. Yeah. I hope you heard that. I, I, I'm so renewed by doing this. It's been 15 years since I've done any work in the traditions, and it's really giving me some new fire. Yeah. Well, I'm the one that uh, goes to closed meetings because I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic and uh, anything. Yeah. So I go to closed meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous to relate to other alcoholics. Yeah. And what I'm finding is there are, are a lot of those that have an ANDA yeah. attached to it, or they don't even identify as an ANDA. They just say, I'm an addict. And I'm the one in the meeting who says, do you have a desire to not drink? And I have been confronted by others in the meeting uh, that I'll are bet. too uh, <laughs> dogmatic about the traditions. Yeah. But they're important to me because yeah. I don't relate to somebody that's a cocaine yeah. or a meth head. Not that I haven't done those things, but that was not my, my yeah. issue. And what I found in here is that um, maybe I'm a bit intolerant that I had to revisit and relook at who I was and how I was approaching them. Yeah. Was I being uh, aggressive versus loving in my approach yeah. because I don't want to see a suffering anybody go back yeah. out and hurt themselves yeah. when I was so busy in fear protecting yeah. what I believe is to be mine. Yeah. So it was interesting reading this so that I have a different approach or yeah. at least a different look at the way I actually try to work right. with them. Yeah. Fear will create rigidity and love will create some fluidity, right? And uh, it's obviously a... a if we can keep the word from the 12th step, that single code word, how can I help? In mind when, in fact, we're talking, is it helpful to be dogmatic and rigid about the enforcement of the spirit of the traditions? Probably not. I'm Rob. Again. Rob. Um, a few highlights, if I may, again, on page Please. 140. Or actually, I guess the, the bottom of 139, the last sentence, every, everybody was scared witless that something or somebody would capsize the boat and dump us all back Absolutely. into the drink. Yeah. Well, I love the phrasing. First of all, who knew the original phrase was scared witless? I yeah, think. yeah. Um, but I like the way he says into the drink, both figurative and <laughs> Yeah, <literal>. yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. Um, on the other hand, I, I would, again... I was, I guess I, it was hard for me to put myself back into the context of, you know, being an alcoholic in the late 1930s and a brand new member of AA. And I wasn't, I couldn't really get in touch with, with the fear. What, what did they really mean? How would it happen? How would the wrong person capsize the boat? And he, you know, he goes on in 140, there's similar phrases. We were resolved to admit nobody but that class of people we termed pure alcoholics mm -hmm. and I, I think they mean only alcoholic not not with other problems although certainly not it's come up in more recent years I know there are people who are very concerned about pure alcoholics coming meaning people who are truly powerless who have you know the allergy and the obsession not quote unquote hard drinkers yeah i would say come, real alcoholics versus real, okay, the, the problem drinkers yeah, right that's exactly. what the big book uses right, right. But that's not what bill's talking no, about no i don't right. think so he's um, talking about people right. who are beggars and tramps and asylum inmates and prisoners and queers yeah. and plain crackpots and <laughs> fallen women oh, okay yeah well, so that's from, I'm reading from the book, or so I did just really make did. that up. <laughs> so, so when they say, you know, any others would surely destroy us, besides if we took in those odd ones, what would decent people say about us? I mean, yeah. the, real, the real thing, uh, what I got from that, which they do, which he does say a couple of pages later, it really was about reputation. It was. It was about Absolutely. About yeah. looking bad. Yeah, because they were trying to get this thing going. They knew it had some traction, and they didn't want anything to ruin it. George. Yeah, I like that phrase about the beggars, tramps, crackpots, fallen women. That's the marina center. That's my favorite. <laughs> that's my favorite meeting place. And, and actually, that is that is actually this tradition in action because we have our share of schizophrenics. 
that sure. come in regularly. Yeah. We've had to get restraining orders against people who were too aggressive. Sure. Uh, there's one guy who is a regular member of the noon meeting, and he's uh, off his meds shall we say, and regularly he creates some kind of disruption. He gets yeah. irate and, and, you know, stalks out of the meeting. At one point, somebody almost came to blows with him. Of course. Over something. And Another spiritual back, giant. And then he, <laughs> then he comes back and apologizes and, you know, sits down and takes his place. Yeah. Um, we have to be a very tolerant group there. We have practice at it. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, yeah, please. I'm Dan, over, overeater, debtor, um, etc. Um, for for me, um, I'm I'm really helped by this with my biological family because I don't I, I I sort of don't choose them, but everything that exists in the that when they talk about outside the program, like those misfits or yeah. schizophrenics, they all exist in my fam in in my biological family and my work family, and all, all the way out, everything, help, and, and so it really helps me because then, then um, I'm more open about my own family because I, I, may I may have worried about, you know, friends, people marrying in and out, um, all kinds of things, but, but this is, when I include them all, my life works a whole lot better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good, thank you. Please. We're, oh, we're going to pass the basket. You know the drill. We're a little light in attendance, and we, we made rent last time, but uh, don't relax. <laughs> $5 a person if you can afford it, and if not, what you can afford, or, and don't worry about it if you can't. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Tom, alcoholic. Hey, Tom. It, it's uh, my impression also, uh, although he uses... Uh, what we kind of snicker at in the language that he used in the 12 and 12 when he published it. But I think also, uh, and, and I'm always curious how we get so wrapped up in the addict versus alcoholic. Uh, you, that's typically you hear that in meetings. But I think he was also talking about transvestites, gays, blacks, Chinese, Mexicans, People oh my God! Oh my I God! I really believe that that's what Bill was talking about. Well, actually, he was. Yeah, that's right. He, well, he was talking about uh, alcoholics, and uh, see, he says uh, even doctor. Now, you, I, this isn't part of the assignment, but there's a lot of rich material in some of the other source documents, and uh, Doctor Bob had expressed uneasiness about admitting women. AA membership when they first appeared, all right, because the men were uncomfortable with it. But not only were the men uncomfortable, the wives of the men were uncomfortable because these were alcoholic women, and you know what kind of people they are, fallen women. And so the wives were very, very seriously concerned to the point that at first they didn't allow women to come to the AA meetings, they gave them to the wives to deal with. Oh, yeah. It was only, see, and the big book was published in April of 1939. The title page says, The Story of 100 Men Who Have Recovered from Alcoholism. There were no women in 1939, April. Four and a half years the program had been around. There were no women. The first woman came in in 1940-41, I believe, and that was Marty Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, and she happened to be a patient of Dr. Tebow, the psychiatrist that was helping Bill, a really bright lady and quite capable. In fact, she started the National Council of Alcoholism, which is a thriving organization today nationally. Please, Alex. Um, so I'm in CODA as well, and uh, the... One of the things that I was hearing here as by, like um, with physicians groups and how important it is to maintain a connection with the greater groups. And one of the things that I've learned is part of my issue is the compare and contrast. And I'm always trying to be better than and compare. And, and um, what I found in my recovery is to see everybody as equal is very hard for me because I was raised in a competitive way. And um, so what I 
and that tradition is so lovely to me because when I'm in a meeting and somebody is behaving inappropriately or um, I always wanted to get very judgmental and um, what I've done instead is to see everybody in the room as a, a little part of me. So that yeah. person that's behaving in a way that I find intolerant and I think, how, am I, how do I relate to them? And I think, well, I wouldn't do that. And then I realize, oh, a little part of me really does want to be slouchy there and checking my phone. And that's the part of me that I don't allow in myself because I was raised to be better than that. Yeah, you know? sure. And to just acknowledge that this person, I, I'm that person too, sure. helps me connect with the whole group and yeah. it helps me get out of that judgment yeah. and helps my recovery. Yeah. And, and thank you very much, Alex. And, and even in the step work, when we were looking at step four and coming to grips with column four of the resentment inventory, where we're taking our own inventory finally and seeing that we are 100% responsible for our perceptions and our attitudes and our feelings and especially our behavior. And we made the comment that there is an ego defense mechanism called projection. If we have something inside of ourselves that we don't like, we place it on outside of us. We place it on other people. And so the simple approach to that, I think I heard Clancy say, you spot it, you got it, <laughs> right? That's projection, all right? And that's what you're talking about. So when you see something in somebody else and you're judging it, take a look as you did, Alex, very healthily. So what's, how do I do that? Where is that coming from? How is that defending my ego? Because it's really just none of my business. Unless it's disruptive, and then uh, as we had the discussion concerning personal integrity with Kim, then you know you have to risk being disliked for the benefit of the whole by bringing it to group conscience, or perhaps first to having a quiet conversation with the person saying, uh, have, doing texting in the meeting may not be in your best interest. All right, but uh, also then from here, the prejudice is so great that 50 white men may stay away from AA in order that we save one colored, all right? Now they're saying here that there was a lot of prejudice, of course, when the book was written in 1939, 1940. They didn't allow blacks in the meetings. Eventually, the group conscience said, well, you could allow one or two in as observers so that they can go and start their own meeting in their, with their own kind. Yeah, seriously, right? Well, we know that. But then eventually, of course, and what um, George was talking about, the first challenge to this, which actually developed the tradition, was uh, in Akron, a uh, African-American individual showed up with bleached blonde hair and earring, Obviously, one or two other issues, <laughs> a drug addict at the very best, and uh, they were not going to have anything to do with it. And you read it someplace in one of the literature pieces. Uh, Dr. Bob was the one that intervened. That, that's disclosed in one of these. Uh, and, and after a lot of heated discussion about not letting the person in, Dr. Bob said, you know, and he's just this authentically Oxford group Christian. He said, what would the master do? Well, I mean, that, that answered the entire question for everybody, and they said, okay, let's, let's go. And so then it began to <laughs> democratize, if you will. All right, anything else on page? Uh, let's go over to 141. Anything on that page anybody would like to comment on? We would neither punish nor deprive any AA of membership, that we must never compel anyone to pay anything, believe anything, or conform to anything, including the steps, all right? Including going to meetings. Because he says, if we do this, we're pronouncing their death sentence. Please. Oh, I, I, was, I wanted to go back to page 140. Uh, the second paragraph, halfway down, it says, uh, yes, sir, we 
cater only to pure and respectable alcoholics. Yeah. And I always thought that was an oxymoron, uh, respectable. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm Linda Coda and Al Anon. <clears throat> and on page 141, that first paragraph, could we then foresee that troublesome people were to become our principal teachers of patience and tolerance? Yeah. Well, thereby hangs many a tale. I mean, not wanting to accept the people that push my buttons and not wanting to accept that if you push my buttons, it's because I am, you know, I haven't worked on those buttons. <laughs> yeah, how come you have buttons? They can be pushed, right? All right. Okay, so then how about 142? Oh, I, Justin. I got one more for one. All right. One. At last, our experience taught us to take away any alcoholic's full chance was some, sometimes to pronounce his uh, a death sentence yeah. and often to condemn him to an endless misery. Yeah. Who dared to be judge, jury, and execution of our own sick brother? Yep. Page one, thank you, Justin. Page 142. Hmm? What we are really afraid of is our reputation. What would the master do? We've, we've looked at that. How about page 143? Oh, this is the guy with the double stigma that I just talked about from Akron. They never really disclose what it is, but it's somewhere in the words that we've all used. But then they have this wonderful description of Ed the Atheist, right? Who was just a thorn in their side, and he, he kept staying sober. Now, eventually, they were vindicated because he did get drunk, and then he did convert and go, hey, let's, let's have our meditation. So that's quite a wonderful story also. All right, so then let's go to the illustrated pamphlet. All right, now we're on uh, the third tradition so it's two pages. Let's look at that first page first. Are there any highlights on that that anybody would like to talk about? All right. It talks about inclusive, never exclusive. Who determines whether or not newcomers qualify? The newcomers themselves, it says. See? Exactly. There are no authorities, no rules, no regulations. We keep saying it because it's human condition. The difference between religion and spirituality, one of the differences is that religion has a lot of rules about exclusivity and membership and theology and liturgy and protocol. And spirituality really is merely the description of finding a relationship with the mystery, finding a relationship with a higher power or with God. All right. The purpose of organized religion is to do that, but because it's filled with human beings, they create lots of t things that people, quote, need to follow over time. And the same thing happens to AA. You all know of meetings that have some rules about what you wear and how you look and et cetera, et cetera. Or at least strong guidelines, really. Okay. Linda, Coda, al -Anon. Um, That sentence that you highlighted, who determines whether or not newcomers qualify, it, what it raises for me is the number of times that people have come and uh, sat down next to me. So what meetings do you go to? I haven't seen you lately. So um, how long have you been in the program? And, you know, it's hard for me to stand here and talk calmly because really what I want to do is start screaming and shouting. Uh, I mean, how, where, what gave them, how did they give themselves that authority to be my judge? Woo. Right. <laughs> Our traditions, it says on this second page, our traditions allow unparalleled freedom, not only to every AA member, but to every AA group. It's an amazing approach to organizing human beings. All right, please. This is where I read about the special interest groups. Yeah. 
So this is where they say that we do have special interests like uh, young, purple, young people's meeting, physician meeting, but they consider themselves AA members first. So that's a nice criteria. Right, yep. Tom. Uh, Tom Alcoholic. Yeah, I hope I'm not a little bit out of sync on this, but uh, uh, I was always under the impression that I think it was Jim Burwell uh, was credited with uh, this notion of God as we understand God. Yeah. But that's not entirely accurate that actually his being a thorn in the side of the fellowship in the beginning was part of this whole notion of uh, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Okay, Jim, you don't even have to believe in God. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. Do you have a comment on that? No. And, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't actually. No. But there's so much wonderful stuff in the AA history. It's a wonder we did survive it. And it was Bill's genius and brilliance and the guidance of, I believe, a higher power that we got the steps and we got it codified in the big book so that it didn't get distorted over years. Then we got the tradition so that the meetings didn't get distorted over years. And then we got the concepts so that the organizational structure and the functioning from a business standpoint didn't get distorted over years. I mean, it's an amazing accumulation of just wonderful guidance and brilliance. Please. Hi, Herb. I'm Duncan. I'm an alcoholic. Duncan. I'm really happy that the... Uh brochure includes the cartoon at the top right of the second page. The tiger by the tail. We aren't a, a bit afraid you'll harm us, never mind how twisted or violent you may be. Yeah. It's the wisdom <laughs> right. of my experience that AA can never be hurt by those they let in. Yeah, yeah. Well, with, a, with an informed group conscience and people who have the courage of integrity also. Please, Rob. Uh, yeah, Rob, compulsive eater. So, yes, there's one more comment on the special interest groups because I did note the contrast in this pamphlet versus the, the original essay from the grapevine. It says, these special interest groups offer only one instance of the diverse and inclusive membership which court made me wonder, how does a special interest group demonstrate inclusive membership? But um, on top, but, but I, mostly what I attributed this to is that Bill's original essay was written in 1948, yeah. and this was written in 1971. Sure. Things have changed since yeah. then. So, you know, the, the approach is a little bit different. That's yeah, it. yeah. We, and Bill had the insight. We know only a, ni a little. More will be revealed. A good friend of mine says, yes, more will be revealed, and it's rarely good news. But anyway. <laughs> All right, so now let's step into the questions that were prompted uh, that uh, would really address the, uh, the question that was asked a lot earlier and about the application at work and in family with special significant relationships and friends, because uh, four through eight, or uh, yeah, probably, uh, are, are all addressing our own personal application of these principles in our personal lives. And so what I'd like to do is take each question globally and have anybody who wants to share pick out a laser-focused mm, comment, reflection, or experience about that, and then we'll go on to the next question, because I'd like to try to actually taste a little bit of each of the questions rather than having to stop halfway through as we have the, the last couple times because we, we're engaged and we're in, uh, with this process and we have lots of experience and ideas about it. So question number four, what is acceptance? Am I accepting of others and their experiences or lack of experiences in my life, etc.? In AA, at work, in my personal relationships with family and friends. Anybody have... Uh, uh, a written uh, thing that they'd like to read if it's short or just a synopsis of it? Nicole Alanon. Hi, Nicole. I was really grateful for this one because the acceptance for me, um, it's easy for me to accept on a group level because that's where I learned about acceptance. And it gets harder as it comes down. So the work thing, I'm getting better at that. 
But my family, I find it to be the hardest place for me to go into acceptance around anything, and I can still spin out on that a lot. So that's where I struggle with with this. Is the group is easy? Yeah. Loving them is easy. Everything else not so much. Sure. Yeah. Keep coming back, Nicole. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, please. You don't have to wait for permission to get up. You can queue up so we don't waste any time in between. Um, um, Katie Alcohawk, the only thing I wanted to say is, you know, I looked up acceptance in the dictionary. Yes. Turns out it means to receive a gift. Yes. And so when I am faced with that clenching tolerance, oh, God, I have to accept this, sometimes now I have the ability to go, okay, where's the gift here? Yeah. Okay, nice. God, what you got going here? Nice. And that changes my attitude completely. See? I, I, I love that. She looked it up and she really translated it into a personal application in terms of acceptance, meaning having a gift connotation. I love the word, in. where's the invitation? I'm disturbed. Where's the invitation? I'm surprised. Where's the invitation? All right. I find resistance. Where's the invitation? George. Hi, George Barrel, alcoholic again. Um, in my work, I, I get a lot of phone calls from people who want all kinds of things that may or may not be related to what I do, well, that are not related. And I've come to accept that my job is to be of service to the community, and if people are calling with something about which I have tangential knowledge but can't actually help them, I give them the benefit of that instead of just saying, I can't help you, goodbye. And so I've become very accepting of my role yeah. as a, just a source of, of help. Well, see, there's a, that's humility, is to know what you know and to know what you don't know. And don't be upset with the fact that you're human and you don't know everything. We don't have to defend that. And so be looking at number five now, and I'll be commenting in just a minute. Uh, Sarah, food addict. Sarah. Um, I'm very grateful that in uh, my 12-step program, I'm taught about acceptance um, because what I wrote was, by accepting others who have the same spiritual need that I do, but come from different backgrounds, have different ideas, different history, by accepting all of that, I become more whole myself. Mm. And it's kind of like, and I just thought about this sitting here, that as an organism, mm. I become more inclusive. So I become like the whole world. Yeah. And in my um, work and personal relationships, I get to practice what I learn in uh, my program. And I'm getting better at it and have recently let go of trying to control my brother who I see addictive behaviors in, but he's not interested in what I do. <laughs> or your control. <laughs> and I've been, or exactly. <laughs> and so I recently hit a bottom about that and realized I'm not being a very good sister, mm. a very loving sister, and that he's a grown man, and you know, let him live his own life, and maybe I can be a, a better demonstration yeah. of what I would like him to know about. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that po thank you, Sarah. That poetic image of uh, going into the dark cave where the alcoholic is, <clears throat> also reminded me of a, a phrase from psychology that helps me with sponsorship, and that is meet them where they are. Not where they should be, not where they want to be, not where they think they ought to be, not where I think they ought to be, not where I want them to be. Meet them where they are. That's about acceptance, isn't it? So how about, am I inclusive with others? Am I truly open-minded, et cetera, in my uh, fellowship at work and in my personal relationship? But think about um, when you're sponsoring. I know in the AA pamphlet, 
on sponsorship, it talks about being circumspect about <clears throat> how you manage sponsees because, and it makes this analogy, the sponsor relationship to the sponsees is much like a family relationship, parent-child, and with sponsees then the possibilities are for sibling rivalry. It's just they're raising the issue, all right? Be conscious of that. Do you have a gathering of sponsees? I'm, I can see the real benefit of that where there's a band of brothers or sisters that has some common ground and they have a support for one another. I could easy, very easily see the difficulty with it. So you just have to think those things through in terms of the implications of it. It sounds like a really good idea, but what are the implications of it? All right. Write a response to these reflections. Consider if I set others on a pedestal, etc. What is the primary principle under this tradition? Write a reflection, life and behavior. And one of the reasons that I took the time to get copies of the principles was that particular piece of the assignment. I thought, well, some people may not have seen or may not have handy the uh, spiritual principles outlined uh, in the steps uh, that I pass out during the step workshop. So I thought that I'd make that available because there's two other handouts. One shows the traditions, the individual weakness and the group weakness, for instance, for tradition three is exclusivity, whereas the principle of that tradition is inclusivity. The spiritual principle of the uh, steps is trust, as I have uh, determined it, and uh, the individual or group action is welcome or acceptance or tolerance. This is what we've been talking about the entire workshop. Acceptance and tolerance or a spirit of what a... There's a, a group of Catholic nuns in our area that runs a retreat center, Mary and Joseph Retreat Center, and their charism, they call that, that's their gift, their special ministry is hospitality. So they're, they're, although they're a group of Catholic Irish nuns, they run a retreat center that's open to everybody. Buddhists and Hindus and atheists and whoever, they can come there, all right, if you need the space for spiritual reasons. I mean, you pay a fee and all, but there, it's open to you because they have this wonderful attitude of welcome. How about we have that when we walk into our meeting, having a hospitality ministry and an attitude of welcome? That might change something. And then the other one is the spiritual substance of anonymity is sacrifice, and we'll see that more in-depth as we go further on with some of the other uh, traditions. But uh, the comment was made at the, in our orientation that we have to give up something personal because we're now part of a group. Um, in 1980, I'll make it quite personal. In 1980, I had uh, cancer up here on my uh, leg. And the doctor said, I have scheduled you to remove your leg tomorrow. And I said, uh, let's get a second opinion. <laughs> Apparently, the second opinion was contrary to that because I'm still walking on two. But I would have been willing to give up my leg to save my life. And that's the point of the sacrifice of the individual in favor of the group. The sacrifice of the cell in favor of the body. Um, so for the, third, uh, for the third tradition, it still is. We give up this need for exclusivity, specialness, uniqueness, for a open attitude of inclusiveness. And of course, the big book suggests that very strongly. Inclusive, never exclusive. The book was written by Viktor Frankl. Man's search for meaning. meaning. Man's search for meaning. 
in the late 40s, early 50s, he was released from Auschwitz. He was a psychiatrist in the late 40, 40s, 45, was uh, captured by the SS and brought to Auschwitz. And because of, he was a psychiatrist MD, he was put in charge of processing the inmates. And he became very clear over time watching who survived and who didn't survive, who was healthy and who was not healthy. He says, I have no, con he wrote a book on it, Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read it, please do. It's so simple. It's a little tiny book, 100 pages. <clears throat> he says, I have no control over being in Auschwitz. I have no control over the guards. I have no control over the food, the weather, my bunkmates, nothing. I have no control over anything. The one thing that I have control over, and I've watched the people survive because they have understood this intuitively, the one thing that I have, uh, uh, that I can manage is my attitude about it. I think that's related to that. Acceptance versus approval. I accept my conditions. This is the reality. And I'm going to live to be the best human being I can be given the circumstances. I don't have to like it. I certainly don't have to condone it. All right. Our respective 12-step fellowships help their members maintain their personal recovery and encourage them to offer to share their recovery experience freely with others who may have a similar problem. This we owe to our fellowship's future, to place our common welfare first, to keep our fellowship united, for on unity depends our lives and the lives of those to come. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, we want the hand of our fellowship always to be there, and for that we are responsible. After a moment of silence, please join me in the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you next week.